So I, want, I lose sleep over this, and I've always wanted to be in the company of a leading biologist to, to get insight into this. We, as an astrophysicist, we've seen throughout time the hubris that comes with any discovery that gets made, or the hubris that prevents the acceptance of a discovery that might demote your sense of self from whatever you previously imagined it to be. Among them is, where is Earth? Is it the center of all things? No, it's not even a significant planet in orbit around an ordinary star in the corner of an ordinary galaxy, one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And so here we are saying, let's search for life in the universe, intelligent life like us. Well, who are we to say that we're intelligent? I mean, I pose that not as a joke question, but it's a very serious question. We define ourselves to be intelligent in ways that no other creature can rival. Okay, now what do we credit that intelligence to? So you look at the genome, and let's take the chimp, I guess that's a really close relative of ours, and we have, what is it, 90, high 90s percent identical, indistinguishable DNA. And the chimp does not build the Hubble telescope, and the chimp does not compose symphonies. So we must then declare that everything we say about us that is intelligent is found in that one and a half percent difference in DNA. Is that first, is that a fair statement yeah. to make? Okay. Let me invert that question. If the genetic difference between humans and chimps is that small, maybe the difference in our intelligence is also that small. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the difference between stacking boxes and reaching a banana, putting up an umbrella when it rains, whatever are these rudimentary things a chimp does that the primatologists roll them forward and boast about, which of course our toddlers can do, maybe the difference between that and the Hubble telescope is as small as that difference in DNA. Because I pose the question, suppose there was another life form on Earth or elsewhere, that in that same sort of vector, that one and a half percent difference we are to chimps, suppose they were one and a half percent different from us. They would then roll the smartest of us in front of their hum humatologists <laughs> and say, Hawking, there's Hawking. Oh, this one is slightly smarter than the rest of them because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head. <laughs> <laughs> like little Timmy over here. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder if we're just blithering idiots in the presence of even a trivially smarter species than us. So therefore, who are we to even assert that, number one, we are intelligent and we're looking for others at least as intelligent as us out there to talk to? By the way, is there any other species on Earth that we can talk to? Can, can we have a conversation with a chimp that has nearly identical DNA? And I don't think we can actually say, hey, what movie do you want to see tonight? But you don't have that conversation with a chimp, yet somehow we believe we want to believe that an alien on another planet that's not even based on DNA, and even if it is, it's not nothing like us, that we could communicate with it. Yeah. I'm screaming at you. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I mean, so what do you, so, so there. Well, I'm all for, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for. Are we as stupid as I'm saying? I'm all for deflating hubris. But, um, I mean, it, it's, it's also true, of course, that our brains are anatomically very, very much bigger than chimps. And so that also is contained, must be contained in some sense in that tiny little percentage of DNA. I think the way to look at the DNA problem is to say that um, it, the, the, the sort of DNA that has been sequenced and the sort of thing that's, that on which we base that calculation of the 98% is, if you look at um, the, uh, again, look at, look at a computer and you'll find that most of the programs that are, that are written are um, at the machine code level are calling up the same set of subroutines. There's a subroutine for pulling down menu bars and a subroutine for moving windows and, and, and so on. That's what we're looking at in this 98%. What we're not looking at is the set of sort of high level instructions that say call this subroutine now, now call this one, now call this one, now call that one. It's not just humans and chimpanzees, all mammals have pretty much the same repertoire of uh, genetic subroutines, and it's the difference between a, a man and a mouse is all, like the difference between a man and a chimpanzee, is the order in which they're called. 
the sequence in which they're called during embryology, which causes the really quite substantial anatomical differences between a human and a mouse, um, and the quite big differences in, in, in brain size. If we assume we're not some measure of things, then as I said earlier, that tells me that the day might come where we could go in, understand which sequences are called in what way, and invent whole new sequences never before dreamt of by biology. Yep, absolutely. Empowering us in ways yes. never before It's Very, known very of. difficult. It's it much more difficult than it sounds, but still it's in, it's in principle possible. Um, but the other point about intelligent life in the universe, um, never mind how we define intelligence, they're only, we're only going to encounter them if they are intelligent enough either to come here, which is very difficult indeed, or to send radio transmissions to us, which is a lot easier, but still requires, let's just define it as, as the quality that you need in order to send information across the universe. Now, you don't have to call that intelligence, but whatever it is, that's what it needs in order to get here, in order for us to, uh, to apprehend it. And I wonder, you know, surely you've walked past a worm that had just crawled out of the earth, and when you did so, you weren't saying to yourself, gee, I wonder what that worm is thinking. You, didn't, you just simply didn't care. You're so far beyond the, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm imagining you simply really don't care what the worm is thinking. And the worm, conversely, has no clue that you consider yourself intelligent. You're just this thing that went by. So can you imagine a species that has such high intelligence that the prospect of communicating with us is simply of no interest to them. Yeah, I can, yeah. And they go by and we, their intelligence is on such a level that we can't even recognize it yes. as intelligence. Yes, and moreover, I think it, it would more or less have to be that much ahead of us if we were ever to meet them, because we're never going to get there. Yeah, we're so, no. we sure as hell not getting there. And, but so, Great. so see any, the NASA budget lately, it would, yeah. it's not. <laughs> so anything that gets here, has got to have a very, very highly developed technology, far more than we've... Than we've uh, that brings done. us to Stephen Hawking's concern about any civilization sufficiently advanced to visit us, what does that say about the consequence of that encounter? Yeah. And he's worried, of course, because he's taking his cue from the history of humans, with one has a more advanced technology than the other, and they visit. Uh, it almost is always bad for those with the lesser technology. And South America, one of the sort of more obvious examples in their first encounter with the Spaniards. So, um, this, or I'm, I don't know if I want to be the first one to shake hands, or shake whatever, whatever, they, whatever, they're, whatever, shake, yes. whatever they're sticking forward. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 so I, have, I'm, I, I want to do it, but I, I still have my, my concerns.